Welcome back. You guys are in for a treat today. This episode is a conversation that George and I had at VOD. And, and, and George got pretty open, pretty honest with the growth and the changes and the challenges and the things that he's had happen in his life over the last uh, year or so. And um, I think you guys are going to really appreciate. Yeah, th- th- these are some of my favorites when when we talk about real life, what's going on, and and the lessons we've learned, and the perspectives that we've gained, and, and work through hard stuff. So, I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it at that. Here we go with Dr. George Hariri. There's actually a hidden benefit if you've turned on Swell, and all of a sudden you have all of these Google reviews coming in. That does something for you. Here's George Hariri telling Dr. Ashley Hovis and I about his experience and what this has meant to him as a new dentist. I don't know about you, Ashley, but I'm a new dentist. I'm 10 months out. So for me, like, I, it's almost therapeutic to like hear that you are a good dentist and patients had a good experience. Like a patient that like, I don't know if that appointment went very well, leaves a five-star review. You're like, oh, like, I guess it did go well. So for me, that's an added benefit of the online, like, good getting reviews because it's like positive feedback for me that I need at this time in my career. I don't know if you have that, if you have tons of confidence. Do you like being told that you're wonderful? Every day. So, and she gets multiple (laughs) reviews every day. Right. It's, it is therapy for the soul. Yeah. So I don't think anybody doesn't want to hear that. That's like an added effect that like they're not, it doesn't help you get more patients. It just helps you be more confident as a dentist. Like I'm, I'm interacting with patients. They like me. Patients like me. If you're ready to have that therapeutic boost to your confidence from those daily reviews pouring in, some more than others, go to swellcx.com slash shared practices to get the absolute lowest price on Swell through our exclusive promo. Once again, that's swellcx.com slash shared practices and start getting more reviews today. George, we are together in person is this the fourth time we've ever been in person? One, two. With Kira Dent standing right over our shoulders. I think this is three. Yeah. Is this, no, we'll, this is four. We'll this there. is four. Well, this is our uh, second time in person that we've all podcasted together. So, Are you encountering this? <laughs> <laughs> you just crashed our podcast. Yeah. That's all that happened. We, we just got uh, podcast bombed. It's like photo bombing. <laughs> she just walks up and starts talking to the mic. We love you, Kira. So this is, this is a conferencing Conference podcasting. Yeah, so we apologize. There's some background noise. Uh, but this, I, I love our inter- in, in-person interviews. Oh, yeah. Our, one of our last ones got me in trouble because we were very honest about my practice. Yeah, and we don't have to talk situation. about it. We're not, <laughs> <laughs> last time you were like, Richard, don't talk about it. <laughs> and, and I was like, no, no, I want to. And Yeah, and have. this time we're going to not talk about anything that's going to get in trouble. So let's talk about you then. Good. Can we talk about you? Yes. Okay. George, you are your own like you're George yeah and I feel like your leadership style because we're, we're talking about leadership culture and change here is different than than what other people might think is like how you should be as a leader like oh here's here's exactly how you should be as a leader and you should take control of everything you should you know make sure that it's exactly how you want it um, you know manage with a tight fist and you, I don't, I, I, how would you describe how, how you lead? This is, this is weird. I'm sorry, audience. Just no, bear with us. For you're a good. So I think like the major breakthrough for me in leadership, right? Like let's, let's kind of like the trajectory of myself as okay. a leader was probably like a neglectful, one of those leaders that doesn't want to talk to my team about anything, doesn't want to can have difficult conversations, is okay with, we'll let things slide, that kind of person. Then, so the, the, you started as a people pleaser. Yeah, people pleaser. Perfect word, right? Just wanted to blend in. Didn't want to own the fact that I'm the boss. Didn't want that responsibility. Just kind of wanted to own the practice and financially like have that, mm-hmm. but didn't want to like actually embrace the ownership of the people. And you wanted to be friends with your team. Yeah, for sure. And um, so, yeah, so that wasn't working at a point, right? Like <laughs> my seller <laughs> left and things started falling off the tracks and like, not, not a whole lot, right? But just a little bit. And it was enough to make me realize I need to be a better leader for my team. And that's when I started really developing my leadership skills. And it was very slow. But I think I had this breakthrough at some point, And it was just like, I need to be myself as a leader. Hmm. That's a big difference between being someone else or being someone like, like right now, 
you're having a lot of guests on season five and they're all talking about leadership. And I think it's important that your audience knows that, you know what, like just because, you know, Paul Edgerson does it this way yeah. doesn't mean that's me. Totally. And so really, I think like in the last really year or two of my life, I've spent a lot of time and effort getting to know myself better, getting to learn about who I am. And that has really lended itself into my leadership style and how I lead. And like my leadership style is unique because it's George is unique. It is so unique. How can we convey this? So this is a good exercise that we did. So um, I had, I had, and I've, I've probably mentioned this like three or four times, but I had this uh, consultant in my office and she said, take out a piece of paper and write down the name of somebody that you admire. And for me, I wrote Steve Kerr and like, I'm going to go on a leadership aside about Steve Kerr after this, after I'm done with the story. Okay. Um, but Steve Kerr, right? So I wrote him down. It's like, well, what do you admire about Steve Kerr? I said, he's funny. He's kind. He empowers his people around him. He's self-deprivating. He's super intelligent and he's really ambitious. Mm. And you said, hmm. Why'd you say, hmm? Well, because the, I, I love the self-deprecating, super intelligent, ambitious. Combination. Like, combination. But, you know, fun and easy to be around at the same time. So then we switched the, like, instead of on the top of that, like, I admire Steve Kerr because it is, I am powerful when I am. Mm. And you read all those same things again, right? Funny, lighthearted, kind, you know, ambitious, uh, empowering. And that's like my leadership style to a T. Okay. And so, and the point of that exercise is you cannot admire something in somebody else unless you have that quality yourself. Right. Or you're at least trying to have that quality. Right. You recognize that quality as something. And so, like, that's my leadership style. Like, Steve Kerr of the Golden State Warriors is, like, the closest thing to me as a leader in my practice, <laughs> right? Like, 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 you could use all of those words to describe me, right? Like, we have a ton of fun in the office. We keep it really lighthearted. I'm super ambitious. Like, really empower the people around me and... um and I'm just genuinely like kind. Like right. I think that's that's me. And like you look at like basketball. I know you're like we, we were making fun of Richard last night so because go I, ahead. I literally until you said Golden State Warriors, I was just like, I don't even know who Stephen Kerr is. So the Golden State Warriors, for those of you who don't know. No, I mean you don't have to describe. No, yeah. no, I think it's I think it's good, right? <laughs> There's a lot of non sports fans out there. So the Golden State Warriors, um, the year before Steve Kerr became the head coach. They lost in the second round of the of the playoffs, in the NBA playoffs, and nobody thought they were, like, that good of a team. And then Steve Kerr became the coach. The next year they win the first NBA title, and then they begin, like, w like a best four-year run in probably NBA history, right, I, I, right. I bet you could say. And literally the only thing that changed between that year that started the run and the year before was the coach. Hmm. And, like, that is the ultimate. And so what he did was one of the most difficult things he had to do is he comes in and the whole team is pissed off that they fired the old guy. Okay. Like, they all loved him. Right. So, and so you've he, taken away the beloved leader. Yeah, the beloved leader before. He walks in. Everybody hates him. He goes to a perennial all-star who has been a long... He's never sat on the bench in his whole career in the NBA. And he benches him. <laughs> and he gets a new guy in the starting lineup that's like a third-year player, Draymond Green. Okay. And so he just like... He walked in, he looked at the situation, identified what was best, no matter how difficult that decision is, mm. and made those super difficult decisions in a way that really was effective and got everybody to buy in to that very different unorthodox role. And he just empowered his assistants, you know, his assistant coaches. He really empowers them. He empowers players. He never takes credit. And he just is a super humble, really ambitious, funny guy. And they have a super lighthearted environment. They're always like chucking balls, half court shots, like throughout practice. And they're just, they take it super light. And like you walk into my office and like, we're always joking around, hanging out, laughing. Like we're never like super serious. Right. But we like, we do really well and we have a good time. And like, so I never really made the connection between me and Steve until I did that exercise. But like, it, it couldn't have been like a more a perfect fit for who I am as a leader. So what got you this comfortable? Because I think about all of our listeners who come into an acquisition. Yeah. They're, they're replacing the leader. They're young. A lot of times they're younger than their team. Um, a lot of times, they, you know, clinically they're trying to prove themselves. They're still learning. They're still making mistakes. Um, and 
they want to implement change and, and we're giving them all these ideas of things that they could do and, and they're trying to decide. And, um, and now they're, they're like, how did you do this? How did you find your voice? How did you relax into this? Yeah, so that's a great, like, I'm so happy you asked that question. That's a, I love interviewing with you because like <laughs> you stop me and you like make me go back to the thing I need to address. Yeah. And it's that idea that you need to know who you are. Like, so personal development and leadership development are two things that can't happen without the other. You right. cannot develop as a leader without developing as a person. And if you develop as a person, you're going to develop as a leader just kind of by, by happenstance. It won't, you can't not. Okay. And so as I developed as a person and, you know, through whether it be therapy, life coaching, whatever it is, just becoming more aware of who I am, what I, like just understanding myself better, then I know like essentially who is George? Like answer that question. And like now I can tell you the answer, but I couldn't have told you the answer a year ago or two. And the answer to that question is then how do you lead? You lead by being who you are in your most authentic self. So you, you open up two little can of worms. You just kind of like peeked into them. I'm going to open these can of worms a little bit more. Yeah. So you said therapy and you said life coaching. I did. So let's talk about both of those. Yeah. And I think that's important, right? And it's, it's super uncomfortable to say, which yeah. is why I just kind of skirted over it. Yeah. Was... But I think I need to talk about it because... I think it's it's one of those things that, like, yeah, like, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about it right now, yeah. but it helps so many people if I just go out in there and talk about it because I think mental health in dentistry is one of the most neglected, and I think that comes through in my practice underwater recordings a lot of the times. So, yeah. um, we're talking about a lot of mental health issues with those docs, but in general, like, so right before I graduated dental school, maybe a few months before I started seeing a therapist, and it was just... Yeah, unhappy. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I just didn't feel happy in my life. And throughout my career, like, I, I, I kind of talk about it every once in a while, but I reached this point in my career where, like, I was making the amount of money I wanted to make. I had my practice. And it was very early on. And I was like, well, this kind of sucks. I'm, like, pretty unhappy. And, like, really the root of the issue was I didn't really know who I was. And I wasn't showing up as, like, me being myself yeah. in every place in my life. I had like my, like nobody at the practice knew about the podcast. No, like I never told anybody in dental school about my show because like it just, I, I like I was my dental school, George. And then I was at home, George. And then I was shared practices, George. And then I was at my practice, George. Yeah. And I, I fully understand living your life in these crazy silos yeah. that can't overlap or, or the world explodes. And so it's because <laughs> that's what I'm living right now. Yeah. But it's, sometimes it's miserable. It is. It's extremely challenging. It's stressful. And then like, you talk about your self-esteem, right? Like yeah. you get a positive result from something that goes well in the office. Great. But you got it by not being yourself. It takes a lot of the pleasure out of it. Mm. And so for me, like, you know, therapy was a lot of like unpacking that, mm. right? And understanding who I am and understanding what's important to me and understanding all of these things so that I can show up as myself, like understanding who that is, what I need and showing up in that same way in all facets of my life. Um, you, so true to shared practices fashion, if someone, like I think about what stops people from getting, from, from seeking help in this way and like reaching out to a therapist. Like the first thing that comes to my mind is like, well, how am I gonna find someone that's actually good? You know, cause it sounds like you found someone that helped you work through all of this. Was that hard to find this person that, that Help I think you? somebody is better than nobody, right? Like, <laughs> okay, like, I, I think that's that's legit, right? Yeah. Um, I have no way of doing that. I just went somewhere and found somebody. Like, honestly, I think anybody is fine. So, but I'm I'm so glad we explored this because I think a lot of people, for me, that's what I think. I'm like, oh well, I would want like the best therapist, or you know, it's like it's hard to find transparent Google reviews of therapists or you know whatever. Just anybody that you can afford, really. Yeah. Like, just go. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but like, right, so like right now I'm divorced. And it was, so like at first it was me showing up in my practice differently. Yeah. And then it was me showing up at shared practices differently. And then in my marriage, I could just never show up that way. And that's sort of how I knew that like that had to change, right? And it's kind of like this road of you go down it and you grow so much as a person. And like we talk about leaders being able to make difficult decisions. Yeah. Like, 
that doesn't stop in your career. Like that transfers, that's like personal development, leadership development are so crossly linked that like you can't have one without the other and you grow as a person and then you're able to make difficult decisions and... Yeah, and, and for our listeners, this is, this is a recent thing. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned that you're divorced and that's, that is kind of a fresh wound. Um, yeah. I, I remember about four or five months ago where, and I, I'm not gonna go in, in depth here at all, but I, you called me about this, uh, about some difficult decisions that you're having to make. I was at Lowe's. I was trying to buy, I think like a hand truck dolly, like with the four wheels to move heavy furniture. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, this is gonna be a quick Lowe's trip. And I ended up like sitting on like a shelf in Lowe's for like 30 minutes as we were like talking through this. Yeah. Um, and, and you had to make some di difficult decisions. Yeah, and you know, like obviously, I'm super transparent and honest about everything that has to do with me. Yeah. And then when it has to do with somebody other than me, like obviously my ex-wife, yeah. like I can't just talk about that openly no. on air. You know what I nor, mean? Nor should you. Yeah, yeah. But like, so like we're still great friends. We have our kids. Like, you know, um, it just was the best thing for both of us. Yeah. And I think that's dealing with that and confronting it and like accepting that is that's, super challenging. I, I was so worried about you and the thing that surprised me the most um, was how quickly you you were like in a better place. Like you made this decision, and I was like, "Holy crap! This is this is a bomb that's going to be, you know, devastating." And 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 it was. But at the same time, your ability to show up, be present, be happy was a very immediate impact like after you'd finally made the decision that you knew was coming for a long time yeah um like definitely it's not a surprise right like you you see it coming for a long time and then it happens but just like going back to the whole like therapy life coaching thing like your ability to really work on yourself personally your mental health and showing up yeah like once so like you know once that happened i think that was the first time in my life for a very long time that I was able to be myself, like 100% who George is in every part of George's life. Right. That does wonders for your happiness. Because you, you were like a new person. Yeah, 100%. Because before it was, it was uh, you, you weren't yourself. I couldn't be. Yeah. And it was nothing to do with any, it's just the situation did not allow for me to be myself. Yeah. And so like, that changes you. Yeah, yeah. for sure, right? Like, yeah. and, um, Again, like you walk down this road of personal and leadership development and I didn't think it would take me there, but it would not have been there if I had not been working on myself as a person and as a leader to the point where I could make that very difficult decision. Yeah. Um, so, so we talked about therapy. We talked about some of the things that have gone on. You're divorced yeah. recently. You mentioned also life coaching. So yeah. talk to us about how, how is life coaching different than therapy? So uh, that's, a, that's a good question, right? So therapy is a lot of how does how how are you dealing with the present and a lot of how the past like things that went through in your childhood affect you currently okay so how history affects present life coaching is very much about being your authentic self and setting goals and moving forward in your life mm. um, professionally and so they're actually like totally different and um, they seem like a good fit for each other for yeah. each other and a lot of times you're addressing the same thing right right just from two different angles um, so you're looking at, you know, how you handle that. And um, I think in both, you know, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I have a lot of advisors around me and those are two of them, you know. Right. And I think it's important to have different perspectives on a, the same situation, to see it from different avenues, do the things my life coach picks up that my therapist doesn't and vice versa. And, um, you know, I value those insights and I do things with them and that's how I grow. And, and so you look at, you know, like, you know, my ability to be a, like a really effective leader and be who I, who be who I am. Yeah. You know, I learned a lot about myself through therapy and I learned a lot about myself through life coaching. And, you know, that is then informing me on how to be the best version of me as a leader in my practice. Right. And, and it's amazing how, so I, I've in the army at one point during residency, I reached out to the behavioral health people there and got some counseling and the counselor, about halfway through our first session, kind of stopped and he said, so it seems to me that like, just at your heart, you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I don't know why, but for like 
a licensed professional to like diagnose me as an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's also concurrently with ADD and yeah. you know uh, some other stuff. But it, it really resonated with me that it was like, okay, someone else can see this, and I kind of knew that, but to really own it and identify with it and embrace that um, makes a difference. Like embracing who 100%. you are. Like I'm a visionary. Yeah. So we're both visionaries. We both are. Yeah. Poor Matt. Yeah. Like Where's Matt? Matt is not here. So Matt Garino, our other partner, is like the, the one that actually gets stuff done. He, we're the guys who think of whatever needs to get done and then not do it. We, <laughs> we did our quarterly. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. but you're, you're, but the thing is that like you're a better executor than I am. Like, Well, for sure. But I delegate, right? Like <laughs> you don't delegate. Like yeah. you, you don't have, I maybe the, it's not the resources to delegate or what, but no, like. No, I'm, I'm a typical dentist. Yeah. Uh, where like I want things to be shiny and I want to do them like perfectly. And so like, but you just I don't do have them, time to do them. I do them myself they just don't happen. or then I don't, then they don't yeah. happen. So I procrastinate <laughs> them and I'm also ADD. So, but I need to somehow own that and figure out how to delegate better. Yeah. Hey, thank you, John, for everything you do. We yeah. We're sitting right next to our podcast producer. Who's, who's the one that makes three shows a week happen. Th thank you, John Pratt. <laughs> Shout out here. And, but like I'm a visionary, right? Yeah. And so in all of my businesses, that is my role. And I'm not the one to integrate. And so my office, we have my office manager. In shared practice, we have Matt. And we have, like, so know thyself and be free, right? Like, yeah. be who oh, you yeah. are and don't be anybody else. If you're the integrator, then you hire a, you hire a coach or somebody to be your visionary. Right. Like, you got to know who you are and have that person you get get people around you that fill in voids that you have. Right. But don't don't try to be, I'm not going to try to be something I'm not. That's how you become unhappy and you're not as effective as a leader as possible. So these terms, visionary and integrator. Yeah. Talk to us about those terms. So those are from the book Traction by mm. Gino Wickman. And that's a book that we use now to run shared practices. Um, so I had, this is actually a great story. So I had um, an office consultant, so Kira. So I reached a point in my practice Man, I like take like ten steps back for a minute. <laughs> so we had Kira in my practice, and Kira Dent. Kira Dent. So the the photo bomber, the the podcast bomber from earlier. Yeah. So I reached a point in my practice, like a year in, like literally a year from the time I bought it, where I was like, okay, I've implemented everything I've wanted to, hmm. which is like it's actually I, I've seen the list of things I actually wrote You're down. You're ridiculous. It's it was massive. Like, You're crazy. Like it was actually like. If you walk into my practice now, it's like nothing like it was before. Right. And I'm super proud of every little thing, the way it's done. Every and little tweak. Yeah. But I was like, okay, like this is, I'm kind of done. I want a second set of eyes. And so she flew in, came to my practice and was like, your leadership is like super strong, but you have no sense of organization to your leadership. Hmm. You know, like they could tell that like as a leader, I was like really, really, um, effective you knew what you wanted you could see it you could communicate my it. team especially back office like that's where they really noticed it was back office like the like you know hygienist getting my patients numb expanded function assistance doing fillings like how much of the back office does not require a dentist mm. is like they said like kind of blew them away <laughs> like you know and she's like actually the comment she made was really really flattering she was like you know honestly i would think that you've been here for at least 10 to 15 years like with wow. with how it runs yeah and like that was really cool but then she's like but you also have a lot of like blind spots and you just hate meetings and I hate like all of the stuff this was the that... funniest text the other day <laughs> so I was like okay George I'm trying to use practice by numbers <laughs> to do the morning huddle there's like the morning huddle ta yeah. tab in, in, in practice by numbers Yeah. so I was like okay how you know do you restrict access or do you know what do you give your team members access to in PBN yeah. you're like no I don't really restrict anything the, you know these people are tracking this these people are tracking that but at the end of the day I was like so do you use the huddle tab for your morning meeting? And George is like, no, I don't, I don't do morning meetings. I was like, w okay, well, so <laughs> you don't believe in morning meetings. He's like, no, I will never do a morning meeting. I was like, but if I were to do one, I'd use the huddle. Yeah. And, and I described how I wanted yeah. to do a morning meeting. You're like, oh yeah, that would be super effective. That would, that would be a really great thing to do. I was like, wait, wait. So you see the value in morning meetings, but you will never do them. Correct. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> <laughs> but you've owned that about yourself. Lead as who you are. Right. Right? Like, did, did I not just talk about that for like, you know what I mean? Well, so w would you ever have your team do a morning huddle without you? Maybe, but... Um, and, and you also have different start times. Yeah, we people. all have different start you times. Kinda, you have and, different shifts in your yeah, office. So, um, but also like, 
uh, we do monthly meetings, right? So sure. Kira came in my office and she noticed this flaw that like literally the way that I make announcements is post a note on my finger walking around and talking to every staff member. You put a post a note on your finger. Literally on my finger, yeah. I saw I that on my demos. Yeah, and I walk around and like I make sure I tell every staff member whatever was on my finger so the, I don't forget. The it's channels, like a list of three things. The channels of communication yeah. is George with a post it note <laughs> walking around the practice. I've done that like at least ten times. And I'll have like three or four <laughs> announcements on there. Like, okay, I need to tell you this, 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 this. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Next staff member. All right, I need to tell you this, 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 this. And if you're lucky, you get two of them in the same place, you can do it. You yeah, know. a little two for two yeah. for one there. But that was our way of making announcements. And um, she was like, Yeah, it's like I can tell, you know, <laughs> and um, it's just like, it just was so, and it's hard because it's just like the, they, they needed a little bit more direction from me. Mm. I was a little bit too empowering. And so, which, okay. The little bit too empowering. Uh, I, I can't remember. I just, I've listened to this week, the episode where Tyler came to your office yeah. and, and experienced it, but remind us you have a coffee mug. This is the power <laughs> of George's delegation. Yeah. Not only, not only is he delegate, Sometimes he even delegates the delegating to his coffee mug. So what does your coffee mug say on it? So there's an expression in my practice, whatever you think is best. And that is something that I will say anytime a team member asks me a question that I'm okay with whatever they think is best. I it's not crucial either way. You trust them to I make this I trust their decision. judgment to make that decision. That does not need to come through me. I say whatever you think is best. I, there's, decision fatigue is real, right? You got right? like 11 oh, yeah. employees. Like, you know. And stuff's always coming to you. Yeah. So whatever you think is best is like a saying. I just started saying it all the time. So they got me a mug that is whatever you think is best. And whenever they ask me a question, I sometimes will raise it up, like, you know, and just like... He, he described it as he'll like, kind of like <laughs> toast them. He'll like raise it up to them <laughs> and then take a drink. So he doesn't have to like say anything. He just has them read the mug, takes a sip. Yeah, uh, you but, got like, this. but then go back to like, that's who I am, right? right? And my team embraced that. And like that for my self-esteem is huge. Right. Because... Like, I am being my authentic self in my practice. It's working. My team is loving it. And they joke around with me and give me this mug. Right. So, like, what does that do for your self-esteem? Like, a ton. Right. Because that's, like, who I am is that, like, hands-off, like, I don't want to be involved in this guy. You know? And, like, so I'm very big on, like, I think if there's one thing to take away from this is that figure out who you are and be that person relentlessly all the time in your practice through your leadership style. So I'm, I'm having a realization here about myself. Good. Um, I have been working on my ability to execute and get crap done. There's a book called, by David Allen called Getting Things Done. There's uh -huh. a whole system. And working on, on my, like, I've wanted to be someone who's, like, really good at doing stuff. Uh-huh. And just like... You're wanting to be somebody you're not. And I'm not that person. Yeah. The only thing that gets me to get crap done is deadlines and pressure. And I have to procrastinate and be anxious about it. And then finally the pressure and the deadline forces me to get that done. And I've been trying to fight that for my entire adult life for yeah. the last 15 years. Um, maybe I need to, to embrace that and figure out how to delegate more and empower more. And there you go. Oh, that's so hard. So I hired a personal assistant. Yeah. Because, so now in, at, in every part of my life, I have an integrator. So integrator is somebody, like we just talked about, somebody that's going to make sure stuff gets done. So okay. like my personal assistant now, like, you know, my bills get paid. Like literally I would not pay bills or check mail. Did or, we talk about the shower curtain incident on air? <laughs> has, this, has this gone up? This has not gone up, so, no. So we meet for our first in-person partner traction meeting where we're, we took a full two days and implemented this book, this system. It was transformational. These last three months, we've done more. Yeah, I know. It's definitely changed shared practices. Absolutely. And Matt and I show up and we're like looking around. Uh, you'd recently separated. So you're in yeah. your own place yeah. and still getting set up. You know, understandably so. When you move into a place, there's like, oh, crap, I got to yeah. get this, I got to get this, I got to get this. I look in the bathroom, <laughs> and there's a shower curtain in the packaging and a shower rod. And I was like, oh, uh, so you just didn't put up the, the, <laughs> the curtain rod? Like, that wasn't part of the plan of, like, <laughs> prepping for guests? And he's like, no, my, my, handy, my handyman hasn't been around yet. He's like, I just batch things. He's like, he puts together my kids' toys. He puts up the shower curtain, all this. And I was like, George, I'll, I'll, I'll put up the shower curtain. <laughs> but George believes, what's the, 
your dad's saying about delegation. So my dad, right? So your dad has been on season five, right? right. So it's like a cool thing. To yeah. like, people get to see the apple in the tree, you know? Oh, definitely. And so my dad has this thing and I never understood it, but like he always was like, oh, I hate, you know, he's a professor and he doesn't teach. He's a professor that like does research only. Right. And, but like technically to stay a professor, he has to do like one class every year. Right. And so he delegates it to his TA, but he has to go like once. And he complains about it for like weeks before. <laughs> and like he's so annoyed with his class. And like I know when he has a class because it's the same class over and over again. It's not like the right. new stuff. Like he just gets annoyed he with the, like, one lecture. the small amount of admin work that comes with that. And, um, and like that's me, right? Yeah. Like, and he, so he's like, you know, George, um, I just, whenever somebody gives me something that I don't want to do, I just don't do it. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I just, I only do things I want to do, you know? Yeah. And, um, I feel yeah. like there's something about like ear, like scratching an ear. Yeah, no. Oh, so yeah, my dad, that, that's a different, my dad. Oh, story, that's right? a different that's, ism. That, that's a different we'll, ism. Yeah. We won't get to okay, that. Okay. That okay. was on the pursuit of ownership. That okay. was, that was that, a that poor, did make, that, that did make the cut. That did not make sense. No. <laughs> um, but like, so yeah, my dad is very much like that. He's very much the visionary and, um, you know, that's what he enjoys. So yeah, I guess I am really like that. And I, did, I didn't realize that until I was an adult and like was fully fledged in who I am. Yeah. Like, oh wait, my dad's the same way. Like it goes back to the whole Steve Kerr thing of like, can't recognize something in others that you don't have yourself. Right. Like I recognize, oh, like that is kind of lazy, but it's also like a relentless pursuit of only doing things you're passionate about. Right. And so putting up curtain rods, not one of those, not things. one of those things. No, but like, <laughs> so right. What am I passionate about? Delegating. Right. I get like this huge high when like some, like you guys were here this weekend, right? Inflatable mattresses, sheets, towels, yeah. you know, rods, groceries, everything. And I didn't do any of it. We, we, th there was a system. Yeah. If, if you wanted something at George's house, you sent him an email with the list and his personal assistant would pick it up the weekend before. If it wasn't on the list, you don't have it. It wasn't going to be there. <laughs> Some things that were assumed, which we shouldn't have assumed. Tylenol, ibuprofen. Nope. None of that in the house. Uh, <laughs> iron, ironing board. Nope. We didn't put it on the list, so it wasn't there. So, But my bread, eggs, butter, LaCroix were all there because yep. I put them on the list. And I did none of it, right? You so, did. like, that's something I'm passionate about. Like, yeah. a system that works at, like, high performance, right? Like... I like to live my life with high performance and minimal effort. Yeah. And that combination is super exhilarating to me. I'm passionate about it. So I get super excited when like I come home and I see the beds assembled, sheets made, blankets, towels, everything's ready for you guys. And like I did nothing. Right. Like that's so cool to me. And like like clinically, I think we like there needs to be a discussion on my clinical delegation. Like that, like at some point, maybe even right now, like the same way, like, oh my gosh, we have this saying in my office of I try to make everything like night guards. Mm. <laughs> like a night guard is a procedure that almost every dentist, like you have a conversation with a patient, they say, I want a night guard, and then you never see them again. Right. The, the assistant takes the impression, adjusts, delivers, like make sure it fits, all that. Yeah. You're good to go. Never again do I have to see that. And so how many things in my practice can we make like night guards? You know, and like we really push the envelope and like in a lot of ways, a lot of like dentures, night guards. You know, Invisalign, night guards. You know, like fillings, pretty much. I don't get the patient numb, and I just prep, and then I leave. Right. You know, and it's like, how many things in my practice can we make so automated that they high peak performance, great work, great quality, efficient, and I just don't do anything. Right. Like, well, that, and I, I love that your pursuit of this defies social norms and expectations. <laughs> <laughs> you just, <laughs> Honey Badger don't care. Um, well, Honey Badger wants to be himself. Right. Right. No, and I love that because my, my like, like, oh, I, I feel like I couldn't delegate this much or ask that other people to do this for me because I'd feel bad or I feel like I should be able to do these things myself. And therefore, you know, there's, you know, a, a, a what I was raised with of like, you should, there's certain work ethic and like, blah, 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 blah. So I need to process some of the things that it's like, yes, you can should all over yourself. You should do this. You should do this. But at the end of the day, if that's not you, you got to figure out what is you and, and make that work. Yeah. And like some people don't like to delegate that much. Yeah. And that's fine. Be yourself. Right. But like for me, man, I can't tell you how much I love that, you know? And, and if, Here's, here's what I really want to make a point of. So we're, we're talking about, and you've talked about it on the pursuit of ownership, um, the practice model of 
um, productive solo versus a profitable group. So, you know, are you a, are you a single doctor who's really driving for the maximum that you can do with your own two hands in a, a really streamlined office? Or are you looking at like a group office? I think if you put someone who does not like to delegate, who's an integrator, who wants to do the cl clinical dentistry themselves and put them in your role, they're going to be miserable because they're going to feel like they need their hands in every pot. Yeah. And, and so I worry that sometimes we oversell the, the larger practice without the, the person who's okay with delegating and letting go of all of these things. Because as soon as you start to scale and you feel like you have to have to control over everything and you have to be doing everything, it, it gets very hard to do. It was, doing what you do would be extremely hard for a lot of people to like care yeah. about the systems, to care about the little things, to streamline and always be working on efficiency, always kind of letting others do more. Um, I think for the majority of dentists, that's not a natural personality. No, and I, I get like, like right, like it, it, my passion is setting these things up and then letting them go. Not doing them. Yeah, yeah like setting them up so I can let them go. Right. You know, um, that's something that's super important to me. So I want to go back to like seven side tangents ago. <laughs> what were we talking about? Um, specifically, so we talked about integrators versus visionaries. visionaries is yes. there another one in traction? Is there a third person type? Um, not in a leadership role. No. Okay. Um, then we also talked about Kira Dent and her coming into your office. Oh, yeah. Leadership structure. Yeah. Yeah. So we developed, so we start, now we do a monthly meeting. Okay. Right. about all I'll tolerate. And you, okay, you will tolerate a monthly meeting. I'll tolerate a monthly meeting. When do you meeting? do it? Uh, during lunch on the first Wednesday of every month. Okay. So it's a lunchtime meeting. Yeah. And um, my office manager runs them because I don't want to. Right. And she, I want her to really take ownership. She's the integrator, right? She's the one that's, you know. And um, so we developed really strong leadership structure. So we have department leads and then we have our office manager. Mm. So our office manager is like actually an office manager now. Right. You know, like all HR issues, handbook, you know, employees coming in late, all that stuff goes through her and all complaints go through her and they try like as much of it gets handled without me as possible. Right. And then department leads. So like if, for example, we have a hygienist who um, like, for example, we hired a hygienist, you know, reappointment rate wasn't the best. And then, you know, that gets handled by department lead, not office manager. Okay. Or like, you know, a hygienist did, you know, we have a protocol and the hygienist didn't quite follow the protocol. That goes, my office manager recognizes it, talks to the department lead, my hygiene lead, and then it gets handled. Mm. And so then like that, we have that structure. We have an assistant lead, a hygiene lead, and a front lead. And so... Was that, was there friction there when you like kind of promoted someone to a lead? No. No. Because I think we promoted the right people that... Like we, we, right. So we, we had a conversation and we won't go into it, but you had a very like, so you undersell yourself a little bit as a leader on this season. Like, you know, you're a leader of three practices in a way and difficult conversations when positioned properly can be very positive. And so it was more of a, Hey, team members, you get to go to one of your fellow team members who does your same job about issues in that department. And then they will handle it for you and make sure that it gets taken care of. Right. And so looking at it that way, as opposed to the way of like, this is your new boss. It's not, this is your, this is your person on your team that is here to help you whenever you need help. Right. And so I think a lot of leadership, like, right. So we talked about things that, you know, like I come, like a lot of this episode has been about me coming as myself as a leader, but then also like positioning things to your team in a way that they can accept the positives of what you're trying to accomplish and having them see it through that filter mm. is you know, a very empowering way to lead your team and have them buy into whatever you're trying to accomplish. That's awesome. Um, and, and I'm, I, I can just see so much value in, in building your team up via those kind of leadership positions now, because without the team leads, it's like a lot, and a lot of people don't have an office manager position. So let's say this is perfect for a dentist who doesn't have a big enough, big enough office for an office manager position, but they could have team leads in each department. Yeah, so you could have like your lead assistant, your lead hygienist, and your lead front desk or whatever. Right. Right. And then they all report directly to you. Right. So then you recognize you are the office manager and the owner. Right. You recognize the issue and then you go say, hey, assistant lead, blank assistant isn't doing this, Rob. Right. You know, go talk to her. Right. But it's kind of hard if you have like two, two, and two. Like, 
that just feels like a. <laughs> I feel like I feel like the leadership structure needs a larger team. It does. Like we have four hygienists, so having one person who's the lead, you know, is just different. Right. Than, than two, two, and two. Yeah, for sure. Well, and and I'm trying to I'm just trying to think of how to adapt this and and figure this out, but. I think also identifying, you know, which of your team members are these integrator types who are, are good at executing, good at getting stuff done. Yeah. Are, are your team leads all that type, more or less? Now that you say it, I realize yes, but <laughs> I didn't realize that before. No. Until now. Until right now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I picked them. Uh, yeah, I think they were just the, the obvious selections. I don't think it was much of a, like, it wasn't like I was deciding between people. It was sure. fairly obvious. Sure. Um, what else? do you feel like, I feel like we've gone through a lot of introspection to allow ourselves to figure out who we are, own that, own our talents, but also, you know, bring other people in. Um, we've talked about confidence on the show before. I think um, you do a great job of exuding confidence about just, and, and being unapologetic about who you are um, and, and your clinical skills. I remember when you, I think we did like a annual update about your practice and you talked a lot about your confidence being early on um, a, a big player, but it- Like lack of confidence. Lack of confidence. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're acting like I was super confident. Like it was definitely a lack of confidence. Well, so, so how do you feel like that interfaces with your leadership over the last year and a half, two years? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I feel like I'm at a time in my life now, in my practice where I feel like I have a lot of control over things and things don't bother me. Like even things can be going like we had, you know, we have replaced the hygienist or like, you know, stuff that like normally would be stressful. You don't really notice anymore because you're sure of yourself and you're, you're happy with who you are. And you know, like, I, like I think a lot of times people are nervous of being themselves as leaders because they don't know how that's going to be received. Right. But the reality is I would argue you have to be yourself as a leader. And if that's not received well, you work on it. You know, like you work on having your team and you know, receive those things about you in a different way. Like, you know, I take long lunches. I come in late in the morning and I leave early. <laughs> like all three. <laughs> I just, I just like, that's, that's the thing that people can't like understand sometimes when we're just trying to describe George is that he's unapologetic about showing up late, taking long lunches and leaving. What do they call your lunches at your so, office? So uh, we had, so I, I market in the schedule sometimes. So like in the morning, if it looks like I'm going to have a long lunch and I don't want them to book something, I'll block it out. This is like totally not practice management advice. Right. Block out the schedule so no other appointments can be added can for be production. Added. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I say, Doctor, I said, Doctor G, long lunch. So they call me Doctor George. So Doctor G, and um, and I, and then I come back and my hygienist is like, who's Doctor Long? <laughs> they thought it was Doctor G and Doctor like, Doctor G and Doctor Long are having lunch. Right. And so um, now we have this running joke where it's um, like I, I came in one morning at like nine thirty. And on the schedule, I just, like, we, we blocked it. And they wrote, Dr. G having breakfast with Dr. Long. <laughs> or it's like, uh, Dr. G happy hour with Dr. Long if I'm leaving early. <laughs> or Dr. G long lunch with Dr. Long. Nice. Or, um, and so that's a thing now where, like, pretty much, I think, like, multiple times a week, you'll see Dr. Long somewhere on our schedule. Pretty much any, it, on any given day, I've either came late, left early, or had a long lunch. Right. I think that's a certainty on every day that I work. Right. One of those three things has happened. If not multiple. And, and part of this for you, too, is, is sustainability. Of, yeah, for sure. You know, it's like this is who you are. And rather than trying to, trying to fight that, you've, you've owned up to it. But, like, right, I, I think somebody here is thinking of a practice like, whoa, my team would be pissed if I came in late yeah. and left early. And, but, like, my team embraces it. That's who I am. You know, and, like, we, might, we mess around with it. I'm sure there's times where they get annoyed with it. But, like, I'm not going to not do that because that's who I am. Like, I'm not the Midwestern work mentality where I'm just going to show up and work really hard. Like, I'm going to be challenging if I have to be here every moment I'm here until right. I'm gone. Right. You know, do I really need to be here for this? Mm, and then I leave, you know? And so, like, yeah, that's who I am. Unapologetically be yourself. Y your team will embrace it or you'll have a new team that will embrace it. <laughs> you'll get there. <laughs> you'll eventually. get there. Like, but they, yeah, and that's a skill, right? Have your team, like, view it positively. Right. Like they got me the mug making fun of my, like, you know, whatever you think is best. Or, you know, we do the, like, we have a lot of fun around the office and a lot of it is poking fun at me and me poking fun at them and just being ourselves and having a blast. That's super important to me. That right there, practice ownership. If you can get it to the point where you can be yourself and have a blast, I think you're doing it right. Yeah. Like, and then, so, right. My, so I, I've had two times in my practice, like, very recently when like finally got things where I want them to be 
you know, in my practice and at the very beginning, like very profitable times in my practice. And they were completely different. Mm. Once I was not doing anything the way I wanted to, I was doing it the way that I thought was best for profit. Right. And the second time I was like, yeah, we're being responsible business owners, but we're having a lot of fun and this is who I am and that's how I'm, that's how I'm leading. Even in those times when I wasn't making great money doing that, and I was kind of in the transitionary period. Between You're much happier. Much happier. Yeah. And like ultimately, what's the purpose of life? Like I don't want to be super, but like, yeah, I think being happy should be on some people's lists at some level, right? Yeah. And like making money should not be as high as being happy, I would think, yeah. for a lot of people. So like start with being happy and find a way to make money being happy. And I think as a leader the best way to be happy is to lead with who you are mm. because then it never feels like you're doing anything other than just being yourself. Right. Which is the easiest thing to do. Absolutely. Well, I, I think that wraps it up. I mean, I, I think that summary right there of tying in th this, your practice is a vehicle for achieving, having joy, serving others, being yourself. And if, and if you can have your practice be an expression of yourself, you're going to be so much better of a leader. So all of it ties in. Thank you so much, George. This awesome. was a blast. This was a blast. Thanks, Richard. Hey. Bye. Okay. That that was a, a, a very raw, honest conversation. And uh, I really appreciated George's willingness to talk through the difficult things he's had in his life. And I, I love George's willingness to self-evaluate and get help and hire people make changes, uh, even when it's, when it's painful, when, when there are hard decisions to make. So hopefully, hopefully you guys really learned and benefited in the same way that I did. Um, and, and I'm super grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that George is, uh, one of, one of my partners and that he bailed me out when, when I was going through one of the darkest times in my life. And so, um, it's been fun on this journey together to support each other and, and, and this was like a little glimpse into that and a lot of the conversations we've been having over the last six months or so. So hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I, I, I'm excited. I, I just did a, a three day tour of Tufts University with, with Jamie Amos and others. There's a lot of good things going on. We've got a lot of good things coming up and uh, we appreciate you guys listening. So we'll, we'll talk with you guys next week on the Shared Practices podcast. I'm excited to announce a partnership with Sandy Pardue. We are rebooting the Dental Drill Bits podcast. Sandy and I sat down and said, what if we did a podcast together? What if we did a whole season of, of your show together? And it works out perfectly because I have a ton of questions and she has a ton of answers. So we combined my skill at asking questions but not necessarily knowing the answer and her skill at answering every single question with a wealth of knowledge, specific examples and experience. If you want to get your dental practice organized if you have trouble with understanding the roles and the functions and the systems of your office, join us every Tuesday on the Dental Drill Bits podcast.